it's difficult to imagine how this presentation can explain things like impulse control disorder, and I doubt that will happen in the next 20 minutes, but hopefully, and actually I'm, I'm thankful to be able to share some facts and some theories about alpha-synuclein with you today. So, alpha-synuclein, what's it all about? We've all heard of it. But before going into that, I'd like to start with a brief historical note. So next year will be 200 years since James Parkinson described in his seminal paper the syndrome, the symptoms that later became uh, to be known by his name. And that'll be 200 years. But it will also be another anniversary. It will be 20 years since alpha-synuclein basically became the center, the focus of most research into the molecular basis of Parkinson's. And that's because of two facts. First, in 1997, it was established that a small minority of forms of Parkinson's can be caused by a mutation in a specific gene on chromosome 4, and that gene encodes alpha-synuclein. So there was a causal link between alpha-synuclein and the development of Parkinson's. And the second thing that happened was that it was established that the pathological hallmark lesion, the signature lesion of Parkinson's, which was called the Lewy body after the discoverer, Frederick Lewy, decades before, was actually made up of tightly packaged clumps of misfolded alpha-synuclein. So here was the possibility of having a marker to make a definitive diagnosis, which was quite easy with histological techniques in the examination of the, of the post-mortem brain. So alpha-synuclein is a protein, but before going into more details about that, I assume not all of us here are conversant with molecular biology on a daily basis, so maybe proteins evoke images, weight watchers or uh, you know, particular types of food like meat and legumes, but actually proteins are much more than that. They are large biomolecules and the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. And you can imagine the amino acids like beads on a necklace. And so the way they assemble, the, se the particular sequence of the amino acids is going to determine the final three-dimensional structure of a particular protein. And the structure will then determine the function of the protein. So structure is very important in, in how proteins work. And proteins are actually es essential for life. There are millions of proteins on Earth, and 30,000 of these are found in the human body, and amazingly, all these proteins are coded by a finite set of 20 amino acids. So that's truly mind-boggling, and proteins are essentially involved in all uh, reactions that constitute life. So they, they both they, they participate in food digestion, creating energy from oxygen and food. They, uh, they are essential for DNA replication, for communication between cells, but they also provide structure, such as for muscles and for support in cells in the form of cytoskeletons. So alpha-synuclein is, is a protein. This is the basic uh, sequence of 140 amino acids. There are three um, sections of the protein that are subdivided and that in some way affect its function. However, these 140 amino acids fold into this three-dimensional structure. This is a diagram, obviously. Uh, but what this is known as is the native monomer. So it's the basic unfolded form of alpha-synuclein as you might find it in the cell when it's not doing anything, just sitting there. Um, but actually, in terms of its function, it is thought to be involved in synaptic transmission, which means in the communication between neurons. And specifically, it seems to have a role in regulating the the, the synaptic vesicle transport, so the transport of these little balloons that contain neurotransmitters, and they're, they're, they're brought to the border of the membrane and then released into the synaptic space, and that's how these two neurons communicate. So it seems to have a role in, in this, obviously a crucial function. And it's quite abundant in neurons mainly, and it can make up up to 0.1% of the brain weight. Now, alpha-synuclein can be found in many different structural Variants. So what I described for you here is the basic native monomer. So this is the, the sort of the normal form and it's physiological and it works well. And there is some variability. Sometimes you can get two of these monomers coupled up into what is called a dimer or it can actually get up to four 
and form a tetramere, but that's, that's all fine because it works. The problems start when you get forms of alpha-synuclein structure or shapes of alpha-synuclein that are increasingly made up of increasing numbers of alpha-synuclein molecules, which tend to be increasingly packaged together. And so you can have these variants, which you can see here already as, as shapes, are quite different from the monomer. And these are oligomers, and this can then progress to even more rigid, insoluble forms that are known as fibrils. I'll just show you another similar diagram just to give you an idea of how things can progress. So here on the left you have the native monomer that I just told you about. And there is a, there is a sort of a continuum between the forms. We don't know what happens, but at some point one alpha synuclein or more molecules can misfold. And this can then lead to a progressive uh, uh, shift towards these more fibrillary forms which are less functional and can actually impair the cell. You go by the oligomeric forms where you, where you only have a few of these molecules packed together and this can then progress towards the more densely packaged forms as you see here, these big stacks. And these are definitely not functional. And ultimately, you can get to the co construction of a Lewy body which is these kind of <coughs> densely packaged tight clumps of alpha-synuclein and this can be easily detected with histological techniques. Just one more concept that I think is central to understand the kind of work that we're doing in terms of the OPDC discovery study. And it is, oh sorry, before that, I would just like to show you how these forms can be seen and, and have different structures when you use a particular type of imaging technique. This is called atomic force microscopy. I know nothing about it, but it's just to show you that fibrils look quite different from oligomers. So then again, you can imagine how this different structure can have consequences on the function. So another key concept is centered around the misfolding event. So basically you have alpha-synuclein misfolding for some reason, and what, what seems to be the case increasingly with, based on experimental evidence is that one misfolded molecule of alpha-synuclein, which is represented here by this little hexagon, if, if this molecule meets a normal alpha-synuclein molecule, it will induce misfolding of that normal molecule. And this will lead to a cascade of further misfolded molecules, and this will then lead to that uh, final result of these fibrils or amyloid fibrils. Now, this event of one misfolded protein inducing misfolding and the other one is called permissive templating. And the theory that is based on this phenomenon is called prion-like propagation. That means that there is an idea that the events, the pathogenic events, the misfolding of this protein in the brain can actually spread to regions beyond the brain, so beyond the central nervous system. And this is important for the purposes of our work specifically because we're looking for markers of a diagnosis of Parkinson's. And the Lewy body is a good marker, but this can only be detected when you have you know, a post-mortem brain that you can study with specific histological techniques. So that excludes any possibility of any use in the clinical setting uh, and, you know, obviously of an early diagnosis. So people have started looking at other regions of the body that contain organs that are connected to the central nervous system. And we have looked, as others, at the gastrointestinal tract because, as you can see in this diagram, there are nerves that originate in the brainstem that reach these regions and control their function. And it's quite easy to obtain tissue from these regions because often one has biopsies for several different reasons. And this gives us an opportunity to check pathology in this region, which possibly mirrors that that is found in the brain. So this is the part that we focus on, the large bowel. And here you can see these thread-like structures that represent nerves reaching the, 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 the layers of the colon and distributing themselves in two networks of nerves. It's just a, um, a close-up of this image. So you have your colon, you have the wall here, and it has different layers. And these, this kind of Swiss cheese-like design and image here shows two networks of nerves and nerve fibers that intertwine and put this region in connection with the brain. And this here is a, just a histological picture showing what you actually see down the microscope. So you have your mucosa here, your submucosa here, and your first neuro uh, uh, nerve plexus is here. This controls secretion. 
And then as you go deeper into the muscle layers, here you have another nerve plexus. But we are only interested in a very superficial bit of this structure because when you do biopsies, you have to be careful not to perforate the colon because this can obviously have fatal consequences. So what we have in terms of tissue available is, it, are these two variants, basically. You can have a very superficial one that only has the mucosa, and if you stain this with a marker for nervous tissue, you'll get this dot-like image which represents nerve fibers following the structures of the mucosa. Or if you're lucky, let's say, you can get a bit of submucosa, and this can disclose the presence of little clumps of neurons which are shown with this kind of staining here. So we used three different techniques to uh, try to detect the different conformations of alpha-synuclein. We first started with traditional immunohistochemistry, using different antibodies specific for different conformations of alpha-synuclein. Then we went on to apply what is called the paraffin-embedded tissue blot. This is a technique which primarily targets fibrillary alpha-synuclein, which can be found in the synapse. And then finally we applied the proximity ligation assay, which is uh, targeting which targets oligomeric forms of alpha-synuclein specifically. And we did, we applied these techniques to the same colonic biopsies that we, that we had. And we were able to collect 71 biopsy samples, or at least, actually, we, we collected biopsy samples from 71 participants in the discovery cohort. In some cases, individuals had more than one biopsy. There were 51 people in this sample with a diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's. In many cases, the biopsy had been taken years before the diagnosis of Parkinson's, which also gives an opportunity to possibly uh, understand a bit more of the pathology before the onset of the clinical symptoms, of the motor symptoms. And this is just an example of the kind of staining that we get when we use traditional immunohistochemistry. As, as you see, these, this kind of staining with antibodies specific for alpha-synuclein shows some overlap, actually pretty good overlap, with the neurological stain, the, the nerve staining that, we just, that I just showed you. So there's a good chance, actually it's quite probable that most of this is inside neurons. Um, however, the question then becomes, can we interpret this staining that we see here in colonic biopsies, in these three images on the top, in the same way that we interpret alpha-synuclein staining in what is called a positive control, so the uh, section of tissue from the brain of a person who had Parkinson's and discloses Lewy bodies, which are unequivocally associated with Parkinson's. So does this mean the same as this? We don't have an answer yet. There may be some limitations in the specific technique which we're trying to bypass, uh, but this, is, this definitely could be very informative. Um, hopefully it will be, uh, both in a clinical way, maybe, to make a diagnosis, but also to understand more about how the pathogenesis evolves and poss possibly find targets for treatment. One further layer of complexity to consider is that we do see some staining in healthy controls, very much less than in the Parkinson's uh, subjects, but still it is there, so there is a problem of interpretation which we're working on now. And these are just examples of the other two techniques. Uh, the, what, what I would just like to show you is that you, you can see some peculiar types of staining, peculiar to each technique. So it does look like we're getting different conformations of alpha-synuclein. This one is the fibrillary form um, using this particular technique, which is the paraffin-embedded tissue blot. And here is the proximity ligation assay where you can see a difference between the control sample and the Parkinson's case sample in the density of the staining. So maybe we're not as lucky as to have complete difference or absence of staining in the controls and uh, presence only in the Parkinson's cases, but maybe we can come up with a threshold that can help us distinguish these two groups. But again, finding this pathology, these, these anatomical alterations in so-called control cases as well can tell us something about uh, some shift in the function of alpha-synuclein which is not clear-cut. One more technique that I would like to tell you about is what we call the alpha-synuclein aggregation assay. This is a very exciting method. This one is based on the misfolding that I told you about just a few minutes ago. So this, I'll just bring this back and quickly go over it again. So the crucial event here is that you have a misfolded alpha-synuclein molecule that induces misfolding of a nearby, so let's say, healthier physiological molecule of alpha-synuclein. 
and this then leads to an accumulation of these amyloid fibrils. Now, another concept that you need to know before that is that there is a molecule, actually it's not a molecule, it's a chemical compound, which is a dye, and this particular dye emits fluorescent light when it connects with amyloid fibrils. So what we're doing now is we're trying to take advantage of these two concepts, so the misfolding and the formation of amyloid fibrils and this dye that emits a signal when, when it does connect with these fibrils by putting these into a single little well or cup. All of these blue little wells in this plastic tray uh, represent where, where we put an individual sample. And what we do, what we're doing at the moment, this is just a blow up of that single well. We take a sample in this case of cerebrospinal fluid from lumbar punctures that you have very generously donated. And we put a very small quantity, 15 microliters is all it takes, into the well. We then add some so-called normal or you know, physiological alpha-synuclein that has been developed by expressing the gene in bacteria. We add that to the well, and then we add the THT, the thioflavin T. And then all of this gets chucked into a shaking oven for several hours. And this particular machine can detect fluorescent light. And so what happens is if in the sample that we are examining there is misfolded alpha-synuclein, it will induce misfolding of the normal alpha-synuclein that we add to it. And this will generate many amyloid fibrils which are detected by our thyroflavin T. And this will generate a signal, a fluorescent light signal, only in the samples that contain the misfolded alpha-synuclein. So we'll be able to distinguish people with the misfolded alpha-synuclein in their sample from people that do not have that, where no, emission, no fluorescent emission will be seen. And this has so far shown sensational reliability in detecting uh, Parkinson's and distinguishing it from people that do not have this form of misfolded alpha-synuclein. So in, in a preliminary group of cases, 19 out of 20, so 95% of Parkinson's cases were identified and none of the uh, cases recruited as controls showed any um, uh, fluorescent light. So that means there, was no, there were no reactions in this sample. Also of interest, Dr. Baig mentioned REM behavior sleep disorder as a potential uh, risk factor for developing Parkinson's. Uh, these, we had three CSF samples from RBD cases and they showed a similar uh, fluorescent pattern to the Parkinson's cases, which means that maybe we can have a tool to uh, identify these cases before, again, before significant uh, neuronal loss has occurred and hopefully in the future can be targeted with specific potentially disease-modifying medication. Just one more thing, we're now trying to move to use this particular assay on a different biological sample. So as you all know, lumbar puncture is uh, can be a bit invasive, not practical always. So we are trying to collect samples of what is called olfactory mucosa. So the cells that transport the sensation of smell to the brain. And these are very special cells because they are in direct continuity with the environment on one side and they are directly linked to the central nervous system on the other side and it's uh, common quite common knowledge that smell can be affected in Parkinson's, as many of you know, and sometimes even before the onset of motor symptoms. So something is going on there. And so we, um, we're using a, a procedure which an ENT specialist carries out, and uh, we, some of us, have volunteered to start seeing whether this is a viable technique, which it seems like it is. Uh, it's quite a straightforward procedure, and basically you need to find these cells in the nasal vault, and to do that, you need to use a little tube with a camera on top. And once you find that region with a brush, you try to collect these cells. You actually can collect them. It takes five minutes. It's not pleasant. It's not, mo I, I would say it's not painful, although it can be. It can be painful. It depends on the anatomy of the nose, which is quite variable from one person to another. However, even if it is painful, and the other side effect can be watering of the eyes, which is quite frequent, both of these fade quickly after finishing, after stopping the procedure, which you can do in any moment, or at the conclusion of the procedure, which takes about five minutes. And so this is me here with a fibroscope, and this is my supervisor, Dr. Laura Parkinen, with the actual brush collecting the samples, which are then stored, and then 
will hopefully used, be used in the future for, to, to, uh, to test this uh, particular aggregation essay. So hopefully in a few weeks' time we'll be able to uh, roll this out. So if any of you are willing to do this, this would be very much appreciated. And while I'm at it, mentioning the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, um, again, we're keen to collect cerebrospinal fluid and we do know that it's not a very uh, sort of pleasant procedure, uh, but it also does have a bit of a worse reputation than it actually is in most cases. So um, if there is anyone here, I know there's one person, I talked to a person today who would be happy to come along during the break time and maybe have a quick interview on, on how their experience was. If anybody else would like to share their experience, if you can find one of us during the break, that would be very much appreciated as well. And just one more thing, since I'm asking for things today, I mean, I'm asking for all parts of your body, so I'll just go ahead and mention the fact that we're also keen for you to consider to register as brain donors. It's a bit like organ donation. The only difference is that the organs are not donated to another person, but rather you decide that in the event of your death, your brain will be available for researchers, uh, specifically on Parkinson's. And this has been a crucial aspect of research in the past and still is. It's a very straightforward procedure to sign up, I mean. Um, <laughs> for the time being, we're in no rush. So uh, I just say that because I know, because I did it, and this is my card. This is what happens when you sign up. You get a donor card, has a number on it, and, um, and that's it. And you might be asked a bit more information in terms of clinical details. Um, there are, these are links that are useful to, to have more information on this aspect of research, or feel free to get in touch with myself or Dr. Laura Parkinen with questions or things you might want to discuss. And yeah, I think that's it. I hope I hope it's, that's been reasonably clear. Thank you very much. And please ask questions if you have any.